Welcome. Good morning. Um, so we're going to roll the tape. Uh, I love saying this. We should mention for this one, oh, yeah. we actually have uh, a clip from the film. We have a storyboard, and then we have some script pages. So we're going to take a look at all of that stuff. Yeah, this uh, is an embarrassment of riches. So I think we're going to start with the storyboard, then go to the, the actual scene, and then we're going to let you guys walk us through the pages, if that works for you. Yeah? Cool. Roll the tape. Actually, one thing before we jump to the pages, um, since most of the people here probably haven't seen the film, if you could give us a little bit of con like, what is the story, where does this scene fit within it? Um, and, and for the folks who may see it online who won't have been able to see the scene, a bit of what happens in the scene, just very quickly. So this is quite early in the film, and we have met the family, and we understand their circumstances, and then something horrible happens and somebody's taken away from them. I don't want to give away too much, hoping that yeah, you Yeah, no will. spoilers, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is just, a be this is just Parwana's transition into becoming a storyteller or using storytelling to, to make sense of her world and her emotions and help others. I think maybe to give a, a broader context for the, 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 the scene as well, so just to tell you a little bit about the, the, the film in general. It's uh, the story of an 11-year-old girl who's growing up in Afghanistan during the Taliban years. 
um, it's a time uh, where young girls and women weren't allowed outside without a male relative to accompany them. So when Pravana's father is taken away, um, she's the only one in, in her household who can take up the mantle and, and become the breadwinner of the family. So that's kind of where the, the, the scene starts off or where, where, where the scene fits in in the film. Should we jump to the pages? Do you want to walk, walk everybody through those or? Or we can just chat and Let's, just, well, let's start with the chat and we'll maybe yeah, we'll pivot there. absolutely. Uh, I want to begin by asking about process. And this is a very unique process because we're working in the world of animation and also in the world of adaptation. Um, so what is your process like, Anita, as the writer beginning, um, taking a book, knowing it's going to be in an animated film? How does that inform your process as it, when you're writing? And then Nora, when you're reading the script, um, how do you begin visualizing that for the screen? So this is the book. So I, I read the book, and, and the first thing I do is I go, it's kind of a method writing what I do. I, I start to feel the feelings of the main character. I, the circumstances don't matter, the, the culture, the place. It's secondary. First of all, I want to understand the person, what kind of person she is, because the feelings we have across time and space are the same. The, the fear I feel and the fear Parvana feels is the same fear. It's, so I, I kind of become one with her feelings and, and her thoughts and her world. And then I read the book and read it over and over again. And then I start to explore the specifics, her culture, what colors she sees every day, what sounds she wakes up to, you know, what, what uh, food she eats. It's very important. So I eat the food. <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> if you like rice. Um, this is a process I can get behind. <laughs> <laughs> very important. Um, and then I spend a lot of time just looking at images. And I try to listen to music, uh, the local music, um, even things that seem, may seem irrelevant, like heavy metal of Afghanistan today. How does it inform Parvana? But well, it informs how feelings are processed by musicians or by metal singers in Afghanistan. So everything becomes relevant. And I kind of meander from one thing to the next and take in images. I don't know where it's going. I don't know what it means. I just let it happen. And I become completely lost. Um, and luckily, I have a very good friend, an artist, who call him, calls himself the Afghan redneck. And, um, he, um, he has helped me understand uh, you know, what makes sense from the perspective of the culture and the place and what doesn't and, and what I might be imposing from my own world and, and, and what is authentic. And then I begin writing the script and I have no clue what's happening to me. It's just kind of first takes over and I'm not thinking about structure, I'm not thinking about you know, act one, act two, act three, I, I let it all go, I don't care. I just uh, let the feelings of the character guide me and then it's, it's, it, it becomes possibly a bit more important later when we want to establish a rhythm to, to the story because storytelling, filmmaking, it's like songs, has to have its own rhythm, the bridge and the quieter part. So yes, it's important, but when I'm writing, I don't care. I just want to flow, and, and that's where the method acting, is, the method writing is very strong because I'm in the world, I'm feeling it, I'm, I'm imagining, I'm, I'm hearing the voices, and so my research really pays off because I'm there. And then I wanted to ask too about the, the process of reading the script for the first time, what that looks like, how kind of your director animator brain begins working. Um, yeah, because animation is a strange medium because it's not like a, a live action script where you go off and you shoot it straight away. You have to enter your editing process straight away when you're delivered a script that you feel is, is ready to go. And you know that you're going to... Um, so the editing process for animation is, you saw the very rough board. Basically, I'll sit with, um, with a script um, and with, uh, or with the microphone um, and with uh, one storyboard artist. But for a film like this, because it was... Um, so sensitive, I just used one storyboard artist to get a pass of the entire film done um, in about nine months, I think. So um, I would draw over his drawings, I would uh, test out the, 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 uh, the dialogue in the film and to see what we needed and what we didn't need and how to 
I, I guess with a film like this as well, I was always aware that even from the subject matter that people were going to want to sit back a little bit. They mightn't even go and see the film because it's, you know, it's such a harsh subject matter to imagine it in animation. You might think, well, I don't really want to emo emotionally engage to that degree. So I knew we had to make something very beautiful, something that um, where the animation was very subtle and uh, uh, very universal gestures and all of this kind of uh, thing. Uh, all of this was in Anita's script because, again, you got the sense that she was seeing everything and uh, from the inside of a body, you know, kind of thing, sitting in a room, she was seeing everything. Um, that meant that there was so rich, so incredibly rich. Um, the way she writes description um, is economic, but poetic. So you usually get one or the, mm -hmm. <laughs> or the other, but, um, but it, was, it was both. Um, when it came to, because again, because the, the animatic process is very rough. I'm on a, an independent film as well. You're aware that you have to figure out as much as you can, as quickly as you can, because things become very expensive. If I went to animation with a scene like that and I hadn't worked out exactly what I was going to keep, um, that's a very expensive problem to have and it means that money doesn't get spent on something else. So, um, so all of these are factors, I guess, that I, I, I take in. But at one point in the film, I'm utter control freak and that's the point, that first animatic, I think, where um, it's, it's just really scrappy drawings. It's you know a few rough sound effects, some temporary uh, uh, dialogue, uh, temporary sound, uh, um, putting that all together because that's the film. That's that's that you know, not many people can read it because it's so rough um, and because it's my voice doing you know talibs, you know, <laughs> um, uh, going from character to character. But 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 I know that once I have that, I have the film. So yeah. You both mentioned editing within your process, and I think that can be a really difficult thing for a lot of writers to kind of develop their own kind of internal editor who's kind of telling them to kill your darlings. Um, how do you both, uh, it's an ongoing process with editing, so how do you both kind of develop your internal goalpost of knowing what to keep and what can go when developing the script towards production? I think it's very, very important to kill your darlings and murder them, <laughs> drown them. There's massacres <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Put them in a lake and let them go. <laughs> I, whatever, whatever way you can do it, you have to do it because uh, sometimes we get attached to things that don't make sense. Uh, and I think I probably had to let go some of my favorite parts, um, especially in, 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 the, in this early setup, the storytelling of uh, Afghanistan's history. I got so wrapped up in the richness and the pain and all the complexities and I was really focused on convey, I must convey how complex it is and how you know we have to understand but in, you know everything that happened in the history of Afghanistan in order to understand Parwana's reality but you know we don't really have to understand everything we have to understand the surroundings and just enough to to, to kind of connect the dots. Um, and then, you know, when I was starting to write, it was very hard to let go and my scripts really suffered. And the moment I decided to, I have to just, without any emotion, let go and, and f keep finding the script and not be attached to anything as in life, you know, the, the better the script will be and then the film. Um, for me, I guess because um, always wanting to to edit, like sitting at an edit machine while it kind of the the, the it's crafted from script into uh, into a storyboard, um, it's always on my mind, you know, uh, editing. I guess, um, but also once you had delivered the this, the the screenplay, that one storyboarder. Um, that I had also is a is a filmmaker himself, you know. So he would just run through uh, very roughly. Um, scenes, but once he hit something, we had a character in it. We had the story world, um, we had the real world, and we had another character that kind of uh, went between the two worlds. Um, and every time he began a sequence that had that character in it, he was flustered and frustrated, and he didn't know how to how to proceed with it. So it was just instinctual. It wasn't an intellectual decision. This character must leave because it takes you know some of the or it, it adds a, a sense of destiny to the film that we don't want. 
Um, it, it was afterwards we were able to understand why the character had to come out. It was literally a, a kind of a gut feeling. And I think a lot of this film, because it's, I also became paralyzed with the beginning of the, the film and trying to give a context, because it's very important for the entire film that we have a sense of context, um, that it's not just about the Taliban, it's about conflict everywhere. It's not just about um, Parana, it's about children, you know, uh, everywhere. Um, so, so to give that, that context without getting carried away and feeling that you have to, especially when you research something and you realize how connected where the, the Taliban come from, you know, kind of thing, and you realize how connected we all are and how responsible <laughs> we, are, are, we all are, um, you know, for, for, for things that are going on in the world. So, but to, yeah, to just give a, 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 a enough of that, but not to, to overwhelm, um, you remember things, this is it, food, food is important you know, uh, things that, that um, take the chaos from us, things, rhythms in our lives and in Parvana's life that she can hold on to when everything is swirling around her, you know. Um, so in, in the, the creation of a story and the, 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 the construction of a story, that's important to finding the things to hang on to. And, and if I may add, you, you mentioned responsibility and I felt an immense responsibility to, to do justice to the story and to the history of Afghanistan because we don't, from what we get from the media and from, it's all rushed, it's all bits and pieces, they don't tell the story, they don't make sense, they don't convey what is the everyday person feeling and how they're living their lives. So, you know, if you imagine Afghanistan, you don't think, if I may come back to heavy metal music, you don't, you don't think heavy metal concerts or headbangers or hipsters or skateboarders, but it all exists. So we just get, it was really important for me to show you the, the fullness of this world. And, and, and once you start researching the history, you see there's so much there and so interesting and fascinating and, you know, and then you have to let go, no. And we must trust the audience to, to connect and understand and, and have just enough for them to then have a thirst to learn more. I wanted to ask about the, the sort of post-animatic, pre-final film writing process, which I find fascinating, both having worked at a studio, because I guess the closest analogy would be reshoots, which you don't really get on an indie film, but you, know, you, you essentially make the movie once with you and the storyboard artist, and then you see what works and what doesn't work, and then you make the movie again. How does that writing process work? Because I imagine that's a lot more collaborative in terms of like the actual writing. Like, okay, we need, to, we need a scene here, this is coming out. How do you approach that? That first animatic was maybe 10 minutes longer than the final film ended up. That is the film, really. Uh, we layer on, on top of that more, you know, the, the, the film, uh, with uh, the second pass of, of, of storyboard, the, that first pass sorts out our story, you know, really. And the second pass is about, okay, now locations, because, you know, the, the, the room has been growing and shrinking and we don't know where the prison is in relation to the, the, the town and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff that creeps into the, the maybe four or five uh, passes of animatic that happen after that. We do trim all the time. Uh, after that first um, animatic where I feel I understand the film, that's when the, the editor comes on, so he'll, he's going to start um, hacking away at it as well. Um, so um, so on independent film, it's different, I think. Uh, and also, I think this film in particular, I think, as well, because I mean, the next film I work on, I'm sure we'll have like five or six um, storyboard artists working you know, at the beginning of the process, and we'll be all trying to write our storyboard with the same personality, I guess. Um, whereas this, I knew I had to only work with people whose sensibilities were really close to my own. That was with the, the, the screenwriter. We couldn't have massive arguments about, um, you know, you know what's right and wrong for Afghanistan. What you know, what 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 uh, what do we leave our audience with? Basically, we had to intuitively be on the same page with that, so that we could focus on all the subtleties. And the same with the storyboard artist uh, Julian Renard, uh, who um, who was aligned uh, as well. And then once that was in place, we could start thinking about filmmaking as in, you know, how big the room is, you know, the, you know, the, the language of the, the, the camera, all of this kind of stuff came after it. It was literally building the film there by there after that. Uh, returning to the clip itself, I wanted to talk about kind of finding this line, knowing that you are creating an animated film that is gonna have an audience of children. 
um, finding this line of not only real world terror, but imagined terror and making it scary enough that you feel like you're being authentic to the source material and kind of conveying the amount of struggle in that world, but also not making it too scary so that it is alienating to children and just kind of finding where that line exists. I think you, you discover that line bit by bit. First, you just immerse yourself and you create a scene that makes sense to you and, and you feel it and you feel the fear. I, I, I didn't really think, and, and I'm sure it might be different for you, I didn't really think about the children, the audience, any of these levels. I just wanted to, for the scene to make sense and, and lead us into the story world and the reasons why she's telling and then all the different complex relationship in there. The scene, you can see the scene as, it's about uh, the sisters and you know the, the subtleties. In the beginning, there's conflict between them. In the end, even through the way they look at each other and the understanding when the mother gets up, I find it one, one of the, my favorite moments in the scene is when the two sisters look at each other after the mom, Fatima gets up. You know, you know, then it's about the mother's loneliness and the mother's fear. It's about Zaki's longing to be held by his mom. It's about Parwana, you know, figuring out what's her role is in what what is her role in the family. So so many so many elements you can get lost in them. You just have to let your intuition lead you. I'm going to use that as a pivot to the pages, if that's okay with you, because I actually am really curious how much of that is on the page. Is it? Can we can we do that? Absolutely. All right. Can we? we you have a clicker, right? Can we can we put the pages on the screen? What? Is that an option? Right. Yeah. That looks like progress. Are I'm we? Just keep clicking. Oh. Nope. I mean, these are beautiful images, though, on the bright side. The poster. Nope. Maybe we're there. Not quite. All right. You were going to say something, Nora. So, while we work on that. I was, I was just going to, um, because from working on Song of the Sea and The Secret of Kells, which is our, our, our previous films, um, I was always really surprised by what, chil what affects children and traumatizes children and what adults think traumatize children mm -hmm. and that there's a huge difference. And the same with the test screenings. When we had maybe the second or third rough animatic, we uh, screened it um, here in Toronto for um, adults and children and the same back in, in, in Ireland. And um, I stood in the foyer um, as, as people were coming out and the children were chatting and the adults were red-eyed and telling you know, me how they felt that children would feel about this, you know, and, and that like, if they knew what was going on, really, that you're not showing them, you know, all of this. So um, um, I, I've since shown it to um, very sensitive young girls who are scared by Harry Potter films and have no problem with the breadwinner, you know? So. Wow. So it's, it's interesting um, what, what, it, how children react. We should never take it for granted, and it's always an exploration. And I don't know. I, I, um, you know we, we make our animatics, we, we test them out, we try and talk to children. Um, we have children <laughs> you know, to, uh, as little test subjects and that. Um, so um, yeah, it, it's, it's very complex, uh, you know, um, but, but it, we don't take it for granted. You, l you can layer your story in a way that, that children feel secure um, I love making films that ha have children asking questions and have them asking their parents questions. Films that you don't just plonk a child in front of and go off and do, you know, your vacuuming or whatever while, you're, while you're, your child is watching a, a film. Just sit with your child and talk about things. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if we have a generation of children who just don't, listen, you know, look at sound bites and, and, you know, make their political opinions based on, you know, whatever, you know, that they, that, that they, they actually think. You know, um, wouldn't that be amazing? It would. <laughs> um, I don't know that we're going to have time to do the pages, but I did want to ask the question. The look, Zaki's desire to be held, is that explicitly stated on the page, or is that subtext that then you guys are having a conversation about as the animatic is made? It, it's definitely mostly subtext. It's never written on the page, Zaki wants to be held, because, you know, the script is such a blueprint and so concrete. But... The, this writing the breadwinner was one of the greatest creative 
experiences of my life, mostly because of Nora. And Nora and I were making the same movie. So everything we were trying to do and striving for and looking for and longing was the same thing. It's such a gift to a writer to have a director like this to work with. And, and, and when we would you know, improve scenes and talk about the script, the back and forth between us would just inspire me to you know, make it better, make it truer, more authentic, look for the right feeling. And so thank you for that, Nora. <laughs> There, there's always a, a missing ingredient, I think, um, with, with uh, as, you, as you layer the film, like, you know, people add, you know, so um, all the other storyboard artists added, the, the voice cast added, uh, you know, an incredible amount to this film. Um, some of our, our, our cast were Afghan, they brought their own stories, their, their, their uh, fathers and mothers' stories, how they came to Canada, you know, a lot of them. Um, so, you know, all, all the way along, you have people adding uh, elements to it. With, uh, with Saki in particular, I wasn't sure whether it was going to work because we were going from seeing something very traumatic with Fatima to going off into story world. And it was always a tonal leap for me that I wasn't sure it was going to work until we got that voice performance from, uh, from you know, uh, it was my son who, it, we, it was Saki's three different children. Uh, we, we used three different children for, for different things. One was good at crying, one was good at, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, so for that one, um, yeah, we, we, we used him. But it's, it's funny because when we were in the, in the sound booth, I was talking to the sound engineer and we were getting ready for it and I realized that he was, he was five at the time but he had a very squeaky voice so he started punching himself and said, what are you doing? And he said, well, that's, that's how I'm going to make myself cry. And I said, no, 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 we, you have to, um, we, we, just, we just say the words and we think of sad things and we think more sad things so we just kind of, you know, kept doing that until he, he started to cry. And then afterwards I asked him, what was he thinking about? And he said that um, in the place called heaven, it's not just young, or it's not just old people. It's uh, young people who, who who kill each other too, you know. Oh my God. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you guys had a really open, communicative, supportive partnership. But in any creative collaboration, there are going to be moments where there are disagreements. How do you guys kind of tackle those? And how do you know, like, this scene has to stay? No, it doesn't. Uh, this line of dialogue has to stay? No, it doesn't. How do you kind of negotiate that so that you make sure that both of your contributions are feeling included in the project? I mean, it was, it was, we were, this is strangely aligned, you know, as in like, you know, one of us would begin a sentence and the other would, would finish it, or you just wouldn't bother finishing the sentence because the <laughs> other one was nodding, you know? So, but there was also, um, Anita is, is um, uh, doesn't jump to defend her work the minute that you ask, you know, kind of thing, can we try it another way? She would immediately uh, understand that, that, that things needed to be different and how they could be different. So we, again, it was uh, with this process and with the budget and everything, that the, the, the less time you can waste with egos, you know, <laughs> the, the, the better. So, um, uh, so that, that was extraordinary. I've never had that experience before because I do it myself. I start defending my work immediately and it takes me a couple of days before I can say, okay, let's try it this <laughs> other way, you know, and, and you never did that. You were just immediately like flowing like water, so, which is amazing. Well, because it, it's not personal, it's not about me, it's about the story, and my role is to go into the story and tell it, and, and, and give the script that most conveys the world, the visuals, and, and triggers our imagination to be there with the characters. Uh, do you want to ask one final no, question? No, no, it's all yours. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask, to wrap up, um, kind of this idea of your Making an animated film, obviously you're going to have an audience of children, but as you mentioned, kind of leaving one of your screenings, you have adults who are taking away something very different from the film. Um, I was wondering about the animatic process, and you said you've been screening for children. What is that like, um, to bring children in to see the film in its early stages and kind of get a vibe for how they're feeling about it? Yeah, it's quite interesting because again, they, they, you know, children have such huge imaginations, so I was never sure, especially with drawings as rough as that, they, they fill in the blanks a lot, you know, so we, we um, had questionnaires coming out and, and sometimes you realize with the rough drawings that, that children were reading into it something completely different than, you know, than uh, what would eventually be on the screen even, you know, because they, they, they're, they, they're incredible imaginations. So. Um, so that making sure that your animatic was at a what is, was at a point where they could they could read what was actually going on, I suppose, was was a big thing. Yeah, but um, but I think at the point where we had children watch it, we had our actual voice cast, so it was like you could actually close your eyes and just listen to a radio play of the film. So, 
So yeah. Very cool. Well, well very yeah. sadly we are out of time. Yeah. Thank Everybody you so much, ladies. Thank yeah. you, Anita. Thank you. And um, I forgot to do this with with Sean, but Florida Project screens tomorrow at 3 p.m. at the Ryerson. The breadwinner tomorrow at 3 p.m. as well, and Saturday, September 16th. So be sure to check it out. And thank you again. Thank you. And we have one more, um, which is very exciting. Uh, Lu Ong Ong, activist and author whose life story and best-selling novel is chronicled in first, They Killed My Father.